Hey guys, this is Stephanie Lemlin, and I play the computer, and also Artemis, and you're listening to Whelmed, The Young Justice Files. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D, 1, 2. Recognized, Rob Kabob, D, 3, 6. Hello team. Today in the Watchtower, we welcome Robert Segarra, one of the amazing minds behind Nerds on a Roll. Besides being a comics, animation, and tabletop RPG fan, Robert is the founder and editor of Nerds on a Roll, where he also plays the Golden Glove on the incredible actual play podcast, Heroes of Halcyon City. You may have heard us mention it before. Robert and the rest of the Nerds on a Roll team have created an amazing show with an engaging story that I absolutely adore listening to every other Tuesday, and I'm so excited to have him on our show to talk about another group of superhero teenagers in the form of Young Justice. Robert, welcome to Whelmed. Thank you for having me, Emily. I'm glad to be here. Thank you for agreeing to come on. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that our discussion episodes draw on anything and everything related to Young Justice, including both seasons of the show so far, the comics, and the video game. So if you have not seen, read, or played all of the material or listened to us talk about it and are spoiler wary, consider this your warning. And while I'm going to try not to spoil Nerds on a Roll, characters and story themes will probably come up at some point. So be aware of that and feel free to pause this episode. Go listen to all of that first and then come back. We won't mind. We'll we'll just wait mm-hmm. here. It's I'll fine. wait. It's fine. <laughs> and with all of that out of the way, let's dive in. So I touched on a few things in the intro, but uh, tell us a little bit more about who you are and what you do. So I am Robert Segarra. I play the Golden Glove on Nerds on a Roll. Basically, we are in actual play podcast focusing on teenage interactions and development, along with having superpowers on the side. Um, So that is our first season as of right now. Uh, We are in the works of creating a second season where we kind of delve into a different set of characters, not really superhero related. So everyone can look forward to that. But our first season is superheroes. Fun. Getting a little little behind the scenes sneak peek of what's Mm -hmm. to come. Awesome. So when did you uh, first see Young Justice? Uh, Was it on the DVD, on Netflix, or were you watching it all the way back when it was on Cartoon Network originally? So I watched it first on Cartoon Network when it first aired. Um, Awesome. Yeah. Same. It it was good. It was definitely uh, one of my favorite shows. I remember I actually caught the tail end, like the second, second season of it. Yeah. During the original air, and I was like, I watched the first few episodes like, I don't understand anything that's going on, but I loved it. (laughs) So I ended up going online and starting back at the first episode and watch it that way. But my first interaction with it was the original air of the second season. Nice. Nice. Do you remember like what episode you came in on? Because I'm just I'm like curious. I'm like, how confused were you? (laughs) I came in season two. uh, I don't know the episode. You'll probably know exactly which one it is but <laughs> it's the one where connor is on the alien planet when they're looking at the tubes yeah. yeah so i jumped in there and i was like what what the heck's going on i don't <laughs> yeah so i ended up having to go back to the first season online and watching it through there and i just ended up binging all the way like it was just so good awesome yes we we here at Whelm degree <laughs> But so what was your history with DC and just kind of like comics in general before you started watching Young Justice? Like, were you an avid comic book fan or were you like me and didn't have any idea what was going on at all? (laughs) So I was in kind of like a a gray area growing up. So I I was really into like superheroes and cartoons, that kind of stuff. Like I imagine like every kid. But uh, I came from a unique background where my dad grew up in the Bronx, New York. And he actually collected all of the kind of original stuff. So in our garage, we have milk crates full of comic books. So he kind of introduced me to that. That's awesome. I remember when I was like 
eight years old, he's like, oh, I have the Civil War comics and the Infinity War comics and all these different things. So I started reading those and I got really hooked into it. He has a lot of Green Lantern, Flash, a lot of Superman and Batman especially. So I started off reading like those comics and my dad's kind of a huge nerd obviously because of the comics. So he was the one who actually was watching it to begin with. And that's how I started watching the young justice. So, Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, so he was already into it and I'm like, Oh, what are you watching? He's like, Oh, I'm watching, I'm watching this DC show. He's over there ironing his clothes, watching it. And I'm like, all right, I'll sit down and watch with you. And so, yeah, oh, that's so great. I love that. So, yeah, I had a lot of like jumping around. So it's like every so often it's like, Oh, I know this one character very well. Because my dad has all the comics for him. But then yeah. I'm like, who the heck is this? And he's like, oh, that's this character. I'm like, how do you know? He's like, I read the comics back in the day. <laughs> I'm like, all right, well, you don't have any of that anymore, so. Oh, <laughs> uh, no, that's so great. That's so great. So when we first talked uh, about you coming on the show and I asked you what some of your favorite aspects of Young Justice were, one of the first things that you mentioned was really enjoying the relationship between Artemis and Kid Flash. Mm -hmm. And me being the resident shipper here on Whelmed, I thought this was a fantastic starting point. I know. It's perfect. (laughs) The super sweethearts. Yes. Yes. All Uh, of them. It's kind of my thing. (laughs) So let's talk about that for a bit. Uh, I first, I wanted to ask, do you have any favorite moments between the two of them? Because that's always the most important shipping question. Ooh. Okay, so I have I have a couple. <laughs> Go for it. I am happy to hear all of them. One of my favorite moments is when they lose their memories. And you can see how, like, yes. they start interacting with each other without the preconceived notions that they had beforehand about each other. And that's where you yes. can really see, like, oh, their relationship, like, really is kind of starting to blossom and like these are kind of their true feelings with each other and then eventually later on you're like like it was always it was always there yeah it was just like it needed something to kind of ignite that so was that like the first moment that you like realized that they kind of had a thing because i know some people i've talked to like didn't realize for most of the first season that they had a thing together was that like the moment you figured it out it was totally when she first came on the team <laughs> yes thank and you. <laughs> she, they were being like so mean to each other i'm like <laughs> they've got a thing for each other like it's so obvious because you're watching you're like that is exactly he doesn't know it but he totally likes her he has the hots yes. for her for sure this is this is what i have always argued mm-hmm. i am i'm glad to hear hear you agree with that <laughs> yeah because it's just like it's um, a typical teenager thing it's like oh yeah i don't i don't really like her not Man, you definitely do. We can see that. <laughs> oh, were there any other moments between the two of them that you really liked? Yes. So this would come from the second season. So when Artemis is Tigress and she is like worrying about him. Oh, um, yeah. So I, I like all the moments where she's like kind of thinking about him and worrying about him. Um, I really like the beginning of the second. I think it's the first episode of the second season where uh, they're having like their life together and they're living together. Yeah. Yeah, I was like, oh, that's a couple episodes. I was like, oh, that's so cute. It. Like, it's nice. I was also kind of bummed that they <laughs> gave up superheroing, but I, th- I thought it was really important to show like they're growing and they're trying to like live their life. But then it also was good to show that Artemis is kind of longing to come back to the, the fray. And then obviously the last episode. <sighs> yeah. It bra- It breaks your heart. Yeah, it does. It does. I was recently rewatching it and like I was still tearing up. I'm like, I've seen this episode so many times. I know exactly what happens. Why uh-huh. am I still crying? Because <laughs> it's so good. It's because like, af- yeah, after you see it too, you watch that last episode over again. You're like, I can see where it's heading and it can't head anywhere else. You're like, I, I was trying to justify it. Like, oh, maybe if he did this different or you're like, no, there's nothing else he could have done. And it's just like, It sucks because he was trying to live his life out with the woman he loves. That ultimately is what destroyed him. And you're like, that's such a that's such a bummer. (sighs) Yeah, Yeah. I I can't disagree. Yeah. Good. Good note. Start the podcast (laughs) on just a real bummer. Good note to start the podcast on all of us being sad about Spitfire. Mm -hmm. I got I got so many messages when the Spitfire Super Sweethearts went out and people were like, you made me cry on the bus to work. I'm like, I'm Uh, sorry. 
I'm yeah, it sorry. just happens. Don't blame don't blame you. Blame DC. <laughs> They're the ones who did it. So going off going from there, uh, what was it like about that relationship between the two of them, just kind of overall, like outside of just all of the adorable moments that kind of like drew you in and made you invested in that and in the show in general? It just felt more real than the rest of them. Obviously, with like Aqualad and his kind of oh, like I like her, but I don't. But also my friends like it. Like it's like yeah, that that can happen. But <laughs> their little teen love triangle. Over yeah, the, it's over like Atlantis. that's you're moving into Riverdale territory. <laughs> which don't get me wrong, I like Riverdale, especially Jughead. Jughead's the best. But it's just like it that doesn't happen often in the real world. Yeah. And then with uh like Nightwing and yeah Zatanna, it's like <laughs> yeah they kind of just happens. It just happens, and like there's a whole thing with that. And that's cute, but I don't see the buildup that I did and like how they kind of start knowing each other better than the other couples on the show, except for maybe Connor and McGann. But that's that's a whole nother issue. That's like when it when it goes south. Yeah, I kn- I know. I'm aware. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's like, this is what I talk about. You I get what that. you mean. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they just they just feel more real. Yeah, I can definitely see that because they have they have their they have their struggle over the course of the season and into season two. That's yeah. really compelling to me and also just fun to watch because banter is fun. Yeah, it is. <laughs> you see them like flirting and everything. You're like, oh, I see it. It's, I ship it so hard. I ship that so hard. <gasps> yes. No, I loved it. I loved it. Like everybody knows me as like the super Martian shipper, but I, sh- I shipped Spitfire too. I loved them. They were adorable. Fingers crossed for season three. <laughs> I know. Oh, God. Don't break my heart, season three. <laughs> when season two ended and it ended on that, I was frantically Googling, like, Se- <laughs> season three confirmed? Like, what's going on with that? And everyone's like, yeah, it's canceled. I was so mad. I you remember, just like, had to wait yeah, five years. <laughs> I, know, I remember walking around the house. I was, like, pissed. Like, I can't, I can't believe DC would do me like this. <laughs> I can't believe it would just leave me out to dry. No, I I understand those feelings very well. That was a very emotionally fraught Saturday morning when season two ended. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but all of that that we were talking about leads me to the next thing that we wanted to touch on when we were talking about having this discussion, uh, which was how you guys incorporated relationships into Nerds on a Roll for Heroes of Halcyon City. Mm-hmm. Because... You guys are playing masks, yes. which means that there's bound to be quite a bit of teen drama. I have never played a game of masks where there wasn't teen drama everywhere. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and you guys have kind of, at this point in the show, kind of moved past just having a love triangle to more of a love octagon at this point, since like every member of the team seems to be having relationship issues at this point in your campaign of what has aired so far, mm-hmm. whether it's... Nazgrim, the alien outsider's unrequited crush on delinquent kid Katie, or Theo's complicated relationship with his civilian girlfriend, Violet Lynn, mm-hmm. or your own character, Golden Gloves' crush on kid Katie, and his actual in game mechanical drive to kiss someone dangerous, mm-hmm. which is one of my favorite things that this game forces people to do. It was, it was very nice. I mean, in terms of like the Golden Glove, I've been really pushing. For it to be with Kid Katie, <laughs> just because one, I like I like um, Artemis with Kid Flash, so it's like, yeah, I can kind of I can kind of see that. So I, I was like, yeah, that'd be that'd be cool. It's a fun dynamic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but then also, uh, Katie and I are actually in a relationship together uh, in real life. So I was like, man, I think it would sound great because we'd be able to convey that, <laughs> but. You know how roles work. Everything's left up to chance. You don't really get to capitalize on it. And then, you know, Katie feels like I lecture her a little bit too hard in game. (laughs) So she's like, there's no way my character would be into you. I'm like, but why? Please. (laughs) Oh, yeah. No, people people who follow me on Twitter know that I've been I've been rooting for it. I've been Mm -hmm. thinking it would be cute, too. So I I understand. It's a fun dynamic. And you guys have a fantastic time playing it, even if it is not romantic. I know. I've been trying. But now I've got I've got glitch now. So, yeah, Yeah. it's like (laughs) kid gloves or glitch. I don't know. 
<laughs> I love them both. They're both great. Um, so how, as a, as a general starting question, how do you guys handle relationships on Nerds on a Roll, just kind of in general as players and with your GM? Like, do you guys have conversations about that? We, we do. We typically try to uh, at least discuss it a little bit. Um, like, hey, like, I want to do this, like, X thing. Lauren, is that something that would be, like, feasible? And then we'd kind of talk to all the other players and be like, do you guys think it's something my character would do? Uh, but that's mostly on, like, the extreme cases. Um, I think we left it in one of the episodes when we were on the rooftop, and that's where the whole shipping of Glitch came around with Golden Glove and Witch. But we sat there for a good half hour talking, like, yeah, but would the Golden Glove kiss her? Like, would would this be a thing? And, like, it ended up just being, like, Theo and me. And he's like, yeah, but is she your type? I'm like, well. <laughs> and that, that divulged into, like, a conversation itself. And then, ultimately, it was just like, yeah, she would be my type. She's kind of like a delinquent. <laughs> yeah, let's go for yeah. it. But we, we try to keep it as real as we possibly can. It's just trying to put yourself in the mindset of a teenager. Yeah, because I know I have I have both read and seen lots of campaigns where it gets awkward because people are kind of, you can do anything you want in an RPG, but people will get really awkward about bringing in that aspect of it for whatever reason. Uh, people will be like, yeah, I'm fine with being best friends with this character. I'm fine with being mortal enemies with this character. But the second somebody's like, I'm romantically interested in this character, everybody kind of shuts down because everyone's like, well, how do we handle that? Like, you handle that the way you handle anything else in this game. You talk about it. Yeah. You ha and I feel like there's no point in just kind of holding back. If you're going yeah. to role play 50%, what's the yeah. point of role playing that? You might as well go in 100%. And then what comes after that is what really drives the story forward. So your interaction with another teammate, whether it's awkward or not, like the best game moments we've had, we've walked away and been like, God, I feel really awkward <laughs> after that. Like, oh, you're supposed to. You went to a party where you got drunk and like someone was hitting on your ex-girlfriend. Like you should feel awkward, Theo. Yeah. You should feel weird yeah. and upset. <laughs> or like, oh, this person that was really important to you got hurt real bad or possibly passed away. It's like, yeah, you should feel bad about that. Like, that's a relationship that you have to have with the people you play with. And a lot of people who play tabletop games, I feel like they're playing with friends or sometimes they just jump into like a one shot or something. But it's hard to role play and feel comfortable with the group that you're with. We have the advantage of we're all friends and we've been friends for a while. And so it's easier to kind of let it all spill out and see what happens versus like if I was just playing with some random group, it's harder to like maybe lecture them or call them out on stuff. Cause it's like, yeah, these are new people. And it's like hard to do that. If you got a good group of friends, I would definitely suggest it and just go out of your way to put all your emotions into it. Yeah. I, t I completely agree with that. I, anyone who has like listened to me be on an actual play podcast has probably heard me either break down giggling or crying at some point because it's like mm -hmm. it's way more fun if you just go for it and you're just completely invested in it mm -hmm. but with with masks because you guys are using that right now for your first yes. campaign have the awesome complicated mechanics in the game like drives and mm -hmm. the actual written down relationships and special moves and stuff like that has that ever kind of influenced the way you've ended up approaching a relationship in game or the way that it's kind of developed over time other than uh, which <laughs> and that situation. Yeah, it, it actually does. Um, it actually does kind of influence it a lot. Uh, so when you when we go into a situation, um, say, like, n not just for me, but anyone. Oh, yeah, I had this relationship with Violet. I need to address that she's here. And like Tom will be like, OK, I need I need a moment. And he'll sit there and he'll think about like, how would I feel given this situation and given what's happened how would like how if i was there how would my character feel and it kind of helps you draw on those emotions because sometimes you forget you're in the moment you're like i'm a superhero i'm fighting i'm doing good stuff but you also have to remember you're a kid first 
before you're a superhero. Yes. And I think I think that's one of the greatest things about masks is that both are held at the same level of importance in the game. Mm -hmm. Like even when you guys uh, picked drives because you had an episode where you all decided to take drives as a bonus on your characters Mm -hmm. that like things like punch a supervillain in the face and admit your true feelings to someone Mm -hmm. were both held at like the same level of being important to a character. Yes. And like, I think that's one of like the fantastic things about masks that it doesn't let you get away with just playing a game where all you do is punch people in the face. It's like, no, 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 sit down and talk about your feelings. This is important. Exactly. Cause it, 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 at the end of the day, it is more important that you had these interactions with these people because it's going to change the outlook of the game. If yeah. you want to just play a game where you fight people as superheroes, like there there's systems for that, but yeah. We chose mass specifically because of the emotions behind it. It just honestly if it helps you role play better and your game is just going to be much more enjoyable if you play with those emotions. Yeah. I I completely agree. And Sense Masks is at least in part inspired by Young Justice to the point that we have played the Young Justice characters mm-hmm. using it. Uh, has Young Justice as a show or just in general ever kind of like influenced your guys' approach to the game or whether that's character choices or relationships like you mentioned Spitfire or anything else like that? Uh, yes. So Young Justice and the original Teen Titans are both huge influences on how we kind of approach playing Mass. So... Uh, in like in the case of relationships, like we've already kind of gone over that, but just how they interact with the adults. So like in Young Justice, it's always kind of, oh, yeah, we we are the Justice League. We are the adult heroes. Like here's some kind of grunt work for you guys to do or like here's some BS work or we're not going to talk to you for a while and we're going to go do our own thing. It's like how how do the kids react to that? How do they kind of step up and show them that, hey, like we're here, we're in the limelight, like we deserve recognition as well. We kind of try to hit the same points uh, like with Speedy, just him in general. He's a great inspiration for uh, most of our characters, just his conflict with authority and then the other superheroes later down the line. But then in the second season, it's him struggling with himself. Like how does he keep going with the knowledge that he's gotten about what's happened to him? So that kind of character development is what we kind of strive for. And just like him looking inward on himself and just trying to figure out who he is, is a big influence, at least for my character, Golden Glove. So I really want to touch on the fact that, yeah, he may present this outwardly appearance that he's a strong savior, but on the inside, he doesn't really know who he is. And he's getting a lot of influences from everyone trying to tell him who he is and he may believe he's the Golden Glove, but he still doesn't know who Arthur Rose is. And so how could he be the Golden Glove when he doesn't know who himself is? It just kind of feels like the Golden Glove is taking over his personality. And eventually he just won't be him. He'll be the Golden Glove. That also feels very, very Superboy to me. Mm-hmm. And how we talk a lot about how Superboy's arc is about questioning whether he's a hero or a weapon and then kind of having to come to terms with the fact that he is both and neither and is whatever he chooses to be. Yeah. And so I see a lot of that in like the way that you're explaining your character. Mm -hmm. But I also know with Nerds on a Roll, because big fan, but I have a panel that I do at uh, a couple of cons every now and then about teenage superheroes. And when I talk about Nerds on a Roll, when trying to figure out how to explain it and talk about like what the themes of it are in comparison to other shows. Mm -hmm. One of the things I mentioned is that it's very much about these characters relationships, not only to each other, but to the adults in their life, which I think is fascinating, uh, especially because every single one of your characters kind of has at least one adult mentor that they kind of look up to. In the case of Golden Glove, you have three. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, either look up to or have to deal with in some way, whether it's Kid Katie's parents or Blue Spider or the multiple gold, golden gloves that have existed. Uh, so how do you guys deal with those relationships, too? Like even outside of everything else we've been talking about. Ooh. So with those, it's it's a little <laughs> harder with those yeah. just because Lauren likes to keep a lot of the mystery to himself, which I understand yes. it's something that us as players is better for us to react and get that kind of raw emotion for it. Um, but there's certain times where 
will make suggestions and he'll be like, you know what? That's a great idea. I do think your parent would act like that. Or I do think Sylvia Stone would act like this. And luckily we had the pleasure of having you on one of our episodes. And so now every time we bring up Blue Spider, we're like, what What would Emily do? I feel like she would do this. And then we're like, okay, yes, that's, that's exactly what Blue Spider Emily would do. <laughs> well, thank you. No, I had so much fun with that episode. I really did. Uh, and just you guys letting letting me be on your show was fantastic. But like I could I could sing the praises of that episode and how much fun it was working with you guys for forever, honestly. As could we. It was so much fun. So with all of those relationships, whether it's the romantic teen drama relationships or even some of like the friendships that you guys have created, because like I find the relationship between uh, Golden Glove and Singularity to be really interesting in the way that you two are friends on the show and things like that. Why or how do you think those relationships are like so important to the narrative that you're creating and like the gameplay that you guys have going or even just tabletop RPGs in general? Like, I think we've touched on this a little bit before, but if you want to go into it a little more. Yeah. So in terms of like Theo and the Golden Glove, it's... I don't want to say it's easy, but it's easier to portray a romantic relationship between two people than it is to create a genuine friendship between like different characters. Because say in a relationship, if you're trying to portray that, like, oh yeah, this person's totally into you and she wants to like make out or like she wants to go on a date or anything like that. It's a little easier to set that up versus why would I be friends with you? Like, like, yeah, I can understand like, oh, we're, we're teenagers. Uh, you know, she thinks you're cute. She wants to go on a date versus like, yeah, I see you around school, but like, why would I want to ever hang out with you? Why would I ever want to be a part of your life? And it's just, it's hard to kind of show like, oh, we were friends before. How do we build that kind of repertoire between the two characters? How do we have that banter that shows that, yeah, they've been friends for a while or yeah. Or this is a new friendship, like, how do you show you're kind of tiptoeing around certain topics and bringing them up slowly to kind of gauge their, like, tolerance of you? Because it's it's a weird it's a weird thing, like, making friends where you have to, in the beginning, kind of start laying yourself out a little at a time to see how much they can kind of tolerate you. And then it's even more rare to find that one person where it's like, yeah, I can be super weird around you and be completely myself and tell you everything because you know it's a lot easier to tell your like your true friends your feelings about someone or even them than it is for you to tell maybe a romantic partner in the beginning so I definitely think portraying friendships is hard and we kind of have to sit there sometimes and think okay and we do have the benefit again of all being friends so it's kind of like yeah okay Katie like you and I were friends before before anything else and we're friends now so like how would how would i be a friend to you at this moment or like tom like what like how how can i convey this feeling to you and then we'll kind of sit there and talk about it like well theo theo kind of feels this way at the moment i'm like okay yeah i can kind of pick that up but then it's also like trying to keep your character in mind like what would he do absolutely and do you have like any tips or things that you guys generally do like do you just talk things out to kind of figure out how that relationship builds and like how you portray a friendship that has been going on for so many years yeah it's it's definitely a collaboration so i i would i would suggest like my one tip would be don't be afraid to ask others like what do you guys think about this like how how do you think i could do this because a lot of things it's like yeah you could think about it on the fly and just pull it up but you get a lot of these creative like collaboration moments where it's like, oh, yeah, this is perfect. And I'd also say don't worry about necessarily what the game has to say. I know that that kind of sounds weird, but in, a, in these kind of games, you have to realize the rules are just kind of guidelines for you to follow. It's a way for you to kind of figure out, OK, this conversation went to X point. What moves fit that? And kind of pick and choose what you want to do. Just like the inclusion of drives. We felt, hey, why doesn't everyone have drives? That that wasn't a move you can do where everyone just gets drives. But it's like, 
why wouldn't we start with move like these drives? It kind of feels like something that should have been there all along. And you kind of just have to play with the rules and basically follow the conversation, have that conversation with everyone and just have fun with it. And then you can find a move that'll fit. I know personally with me, we have through Whelmed our Patreon. Some people listening may know about this, that we do a masks game a few times a year with some of our patrons from a certain level. And with that, when we were first coming up with our characters and I was involved in it and I created my 16 year old delinquent that I talk about on Twitter every now and then and people like her and her playlists. We also had a doomed and our doomed character was 13 years old. But one of the relationships that's like one of the defaults for the doom is uh, something along the lines of I really want to kiss blank before I die or something like that. Mm -hmm. And he was trying to decide who he wanted that to be on our team and was kind of trying to pick one of the NPCs because he didn't want it to be weird, I think was part of it. Like, because mm-hmm. we were talking about people get awkward about these romantic things. And I just casually suggested, I was like, if you want it to be my character, because I was the only girl on the team and I understood all of that, I was like, I am fine with you picking it as long as you understand that my character is never going to kiss your 13 year old. And like, we had that conversation. He's like, oh yeah, no, I can totally play with that and have fun with it. Like once we had like kind of hashed Mm -hmm. it out and we're like, you realize that that relationship doesn't have to go the way that it's written down. You can play that out as just, no, this is never actually going to happen, sadly, because you're three years younger than her. Mm -hmm. But (laughs) it's fun. And like finding those ways around, I think is really, really important in having those conversations. Oh yeah. Just to make sure everybody's having a good game and communicating. I even think it would have been interesting if that character chose um, maybe to kiss their mom. Oh, yeah. Because it, it doesn't have to be a romantic thing. Yes. Be like maybe I you have maybe agree. you have a difficult relationship with your mom or your dad, and then that's the person you want to kiss goodbye. Yeah. Like that that would have been super interesting, and it's not something explicit that the playbook suggests. It's just something you kind of have to think. Okay, what would what would be interesting? What would be fun? And Tom does a really good job with it, or the singularity, where he'll sit there and he'll be like, he goes, huh, this is what I would want to do, but what's the worst thing I could do? This, <laughs> I'm going to do the worst thing. Because he, yes. he's like, it's not interesting if I do the best thing. It's much more interesting if I do the thing that'll get me in the most trouble. Yes. Our phrase in our Patreon game is, okay, I'm going to try something stupid, Mm -hmm. Uh, which started as an accident and then everybody kind of just latched onto it. If any time we get into a situation where we're like, there's there's no good options here, I'm going to do something ridiculous. Yes, exactly. It gets more fun when you go into a situation being like, I could either just we could do nothing and fix everything and it would be fine. Mm-hmm. Or I can punch the supervillain in the face when I really shouldn't punch the supervillain in the face. I'm like, that's the more fun option. Exactly. You're like, I got I got to do it. It's my obligation as a teenager <laughs> to punch that superhero or grab that girl's hand or do whatever because it just it's better. Yep. And those and again, those are held at the same level, punching a superhero in the face and holding someone's hand. Same level of importance yes. in masks. I mean, it make it makes sense because when say it's your first date, you're sitting you're sitting there, say you're in a movie theater watching a movie and you're like, man, I really want to hold this girl's hand. It's it's a struggle to do that. <laughs> you're sitting there sweating bullets. You're like, I, I can't do it. I can't do it. But then you're like, I can't. I can't. And I imagine that's what a superhero would think. Like, oh, my God, I'm going to punch this villain who's shooting out lightning at me like and I have no superpowers how am I going to fight this person it I suggest I think it takes the same amount of courage I I would agree and tying it back to young justice young justice does a really great job of showing that too in that same way that masks does of like I know me and Rich have talked about it before of like one of the things that I personally love about Miss Martian is the fact that especially in season one, like they'll get into a fight and she's like, yeah, I can take this. I can rip that thing out of the sky with my mind. No problem. But early season one, Superboy walks in the room and she forgets how words work mm-hmm. every few every few minutes and getting to do both of those things and create characters that are that complicated, I think was something Young Justice did really well and Masks forces mm-hmm. you to do well. Yes. Like, I feel like you can't make an uncomplicated Masks character. Yeah. And you guys show that fantastically on your show. Thank you. 
like I remember first episode, they all kind of start out as like, well, here's here's my concept for what a teenage superhero would be like. And then very quickly, you guys are like, OK, but now I'm adding issues. Now they all have problems. And I'm like, this is so much fun. Yeah. And I think Rich, uh, Rich kind of talked about that uh, with us in a little bit where like our characters in the beginning, it's kind of like, oh, yeah, it's kind of silly, kind of like goofy, like a teenager with short shorts, a mustache and golden boxing gloves. You're like. Yeah, this is super... A giant lizard alien. Yeah, exactly. Like, That's... this is so yeah. <laughs> kind of... I don't want to say cliche, but it's like... It's kind of like, oh, okay, whatever. But then, bam, second issue hits. It's like, no, we have problems. Like, yes. like yeah, maybe our costume's silly, but I'm a <laughs> teenager as a superhero. Of course, I'm going to be a little silly. Hey, exactly. But it's how you play up those emotions and, like, the issues that come along with it that really make the characters unique. Because you can have two dooms exactly the same, but the way you play them is going to change like significantly how the character is. Yeah, I and I love that, and I love how just as this turns into Emily and Robert just talk about how awesome masks is mm-hmm. by accident. <laughs> uh, even with like the character descriptions on masks, when they give you like the little blurbs on what your character can look like, even those I feel like inform character in that. Thinking about like the delinquent one because I play her the most. Uh, it has options where it's like eyes doesn't it doesn't give you any colors as options. It gives you like sarcastic, cold, laughing, and like two other options. And I'm like, oh, that immediately just tells you more about your character instead of like doesn't matter what your character look like looks like. It matters what your character feels like. Exactly because your character you're not starting off as oh I just got my powers or I'm going to get my powers. It's you're starting off as a person. Yes. Not I am this superhero. It's you're starting off as this person who already has all this background to them. And like all these feelings, emotions, and history behind that. And you're trying to flavor it with the superpowers. Yes. I completely agree with all of that. And since we're still we're still talking about masks because it's great but like do you have any other games that you love or really enjoy playing or running that you kind of think kind of facilitate these kinds of relationships as well as masks does or in different ways that ma- than masks does so i have played quite a bit of uh dungeon world some was not from lauren uh this is way before i met lauren but we are starting to play some dungeon world so dungeon world is another powered by the apocalypse system Yes. Think of it as D and D, like five E, but with power by the apocalypse. Now we are trying to take the lessons we learned from mass, really try to heighten it. But what Dungeon World does really well is you are the playbook you are, or the character you are. So if you are the thief, like you're not just some random person who is a thief and eventually becomes good. It's no, no, no. You are the like the best the one thief. right now. Yeah. Like you are coming in already with all this baggage associated with you. Yes. And that's just inherent from you doing that. So like I'm playing an emulator. Well, an emulator controls fire and their whole deal is sacrifice. So it's like, yeah, I'm going to sacrifice pieces of myself to gain power. But like that, that comes with something that's kind of like a war veteran who comes back You've given so much and now you have to deal with life now after giving up things in order to accomplish something. So you get kind of that like PTSD kind of like self-loathing feel from that character because it's it's just inherent of that. And you're the best of that character. But it's also like, yeah, I have these issues and I'm going to show you that. And the playbook is just there to kind of heighten it. Yeah, that sounds fantastic. I know personally, I really love taking it back to some of the lighter stuff Mm -hmm. we've talked about real quick. I personally uh, love um, Alex Roberts's game uh, Starcrossed that I haven't played and I always just want to figure out some way to play it where it's the we've talked about it a bit on the show before as the game that lets you play the scene of Cheshire and Roy in the prison oh, in season one. That would be We're like, good. That's the game that you use to play that scene in that it's the idea of you are two characters that really want to date, but for whatever reason, can't. And mm-hmm. so all you don't roll any dice. You pull blocks on a Jenga tower. Mm-hmm. And because I've listened to a lot of people create characters for it and a lot of awesome APs out there for it of like your character sheet for that is 
basically all of it is about being in relation to the other person and how that's a really fascinating way of like your character doesn't really matter on their own in this game. It's just in relation to how does your character interact with this other character and other one that I have that I have actually played that I really enjoyed was uh, called Breaking the Ice, and I played that over on Party of One, where we did a superhero version of it, where it's the idea of two people going on three dates, and you kind of figure out how the relationship builds from there, and we played it as Hawkeye and Black Widow, Ooh, uh, and had a yeah, lot of okay. fun with that. Uh, and with that, the same thing of your character sheet is just kind of built on, like, different aspects of yourself that you might have in common with the other person and you get bonuses based on like things you have in common or how you two interact well with each other. And it's a really cute game and we had a lot of fun with it. So if people are looking for more things to do ridiculous teen superhero drama, I suggest both of those. And apparently Dungeon World too. Not for teen superhero drama, but for other types of drama. Exactly. Because that sounds really awesome. Yeah, it is. And I feel like I, I, I would suggest people play Mass just for a couple sessions, try to get into it. And that's just to help prepare you to play other tabletop RPGs. Because, yeah, math sets up these emotions for you to, like, check a box, like, I'm angry or I'm (laughs) sad. But at the end of the day, if if you got rid of those boxes, why can't you do the exact same thing? Yeah. So it doesn't matter necessarily what the character sheet says. It's... How does that involve the other players? So just don't worry about like the character sheet or the system you're playing. If you really want to play a cyberpunk game, then play a cyberpunk game. But you don't have to limit yourself to be like, oh, no, like this is strictly cyberpunk. I'm not going to get into all these emotions like, no, it (laughs) comes. No, do it. Yeah, it comes with the territory. You have to kind of play into that. Yeah. Some of some of my favorite moments from like APs that I listen to that aren't focused solely on this stuff and don't have mechanics for like your character feels emotions now roll dice mm-hmm. are in moments where people are like, OK, let's let's take five minutes and talk about our feelings. I'm like, it makes your game better because mm-hmm. it makes you more invested in like fighting an enemy doesn't matter unless you are invested in whether or not you and the rest of your party survive for more reasons than just well, we want to survive and keep playing the game. Like, there has to be a narrative reason that you care about getting through this. Exactly. Because it's like, at the end of the day, you can just make a new character and keep the story going. But I want to feel that relationship between characters. So then if you do happen to die, it's impactful. It's meaningful. You're like, wow, like, I feel I have to take a break because this was just so much. And I don't know if you've listened to The Adventure Zone, I haven't. I have heard good things, but I have not gotten a chance to listen to it. They do have these two characters in one of their arcs and you see little hints that they they are kind of they kind of have a romantic relationship together. Then it all culminates at the end of that this one arc where they lose each other and the players are there just to witness them losing each other. Yeah, it's because of their interactions and their feelings that you kind of see how that relationship developed and where how they got to that point. So it's just it, it is definitely one of the best parts of listening to an actual player, even playing tabletop RPGs, just trying to hit you hard, like in the emotions, because that's that's the fun of it. Yeah, because I know I have not listened to the Adventure Zone, but I am an avid Critical Role fan. And a lot of a lot of that, especially in season one, because now they've moved into season two and are trying to figure out their relationships. But season one had some incredible moving relationships that like I would just be sitting there watching the episodes just crying because I'm like, I care so much and you're going through so much pain with these characters. I'm like, if you are able to pull that off in a game that is some graph paper and some dice, I'm like, you're doing this right. Exactly. You're having an incredible time. And I just... Love that. And I love that with your guys' show, too, because yeah, you, you guys do such a great job with it. So before we wrap up, last couple of things. Is there anything else that you want to talk about? Anything that maybe you're looking forward to in season three of Young Justice? Oof. There's a lot of things <laughs> I'm looking forward to in season three of Young Justice. So obviously, I want my favorite speedster to come back. <laughs> we and all want him back. <laughs> I want him back. I'm so bummed that he's gone. He. Okay, I like Impulse. He grew on me. At first, I didn't like him. But don't you dare put on his his uniform. <laughs> he is he is a my he is my Flash. Like I grew like it's it's a 
it makes you feel like you grew up with him. And I'm like, that's my man. And he's gone and his girl is hurting. <laughs> but then yeah. I, I also don't want him to come back too far in the future. <laughs> because yeah. I don't know, it's just it's going to be rough if they start off with Artemis maybe being in a romantic relationship with someone else oh, or God, starting to so get painful. there and he comes back. I'm like, Oh God, please don't, don't do that to me. But at the same time, it's like, please do that. <laughs> so I want to see that. I do want to see more of Nightwing one leading and being Nightwing, but I also want to hit, I think it would be cool if Starfire made an appearance and then he's still, he's still kind of, dating Zatanna. So I think that would be cool too. Technically, since we've just finished reviewing the comics, him and Zatanna aren't together by season two. Oh, really? Oh, no. They break break up during the time skip. I'm sorry to inform you. (laughs) It's in the comics. They're still friends. They're they're still flirting and still friends, but they're not technically together. He kind of has a thing with Batgirl that's also not official in any way. He just kind of has a thing with Batgirl. It's just it's just Nightwing being all over the place. <laughs> He's a good guy. He just cares about a lot of people. We've okay, we've had we, the, we could, we've we had could this say debate that. before. <laughs> we can say he cares about a lot of people. He I me me and Rich have had this had this uh getting up on our soapbox for Nightwing being allowed to date as many people as he wants in his life as long as nobody's cheating on anybody. Yes, and yes. Apparently I agree everybody's with that. fine. I agree with that. <laughs> Uh, there's no, there's no way everyone's fine, but I would like to see that, how no one, not everyone's fine. Apparently, according to the comics, Nightwing is friends with all of his exes and everybody's fine with it. It's his one superpower and he admits it. That must be his superpower because there is no way that would happen. (laughs) I do not subscribe to that, but... Nightwing. Read the comics. Can, Hashtag can, buy YJ you, comics on Comixology. Yes, yes. I agree that uh, Starfire showing up would be really interesting for season three or maybe season four if we get yeah. a season four uh, somewhere down the line because she's an awesome character. Yes. Um, I would also like to see more of Static Shock. Yes, yes. I don't know about you, but I watched the original run of Static Shock when I was a kid on like the cart- like the Warner Brothers Saturday morning cartoons. And that right there was masks as well. Like I rewatched it and I was like, yeah, this is, this is masks. But as like a low income, well, I mean, yeah, low income area for this person that's facing all these like racial biases and difficulties. So I would like to see more of him uh, and him being part of the team, uh, just because I thought, I thought it was cool how they kind of brought him in. And it's kind of, it kind of makes you feel nostalgic at a point. Yeah. I can totally see that. Like that was that's that's me with the fact that they just confirmed spoilers in season three because I'm like, I love Stephanie Brown. Thank you. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So, yeah, I get it. But thank you so much for spending some time with us in the Watchtower, Robert. Of course. Thank you for having me. Of course. I was so glad you decided to come on. Uh, So where can people find you here on Earth Prime? So you guys can find me on the Nerds on a Roll podcast. Um, We do have a Facebook, Instagram and Twitter, and it's all just nerds on a roll uh podcast but you can find me personally on twitter at rob kebab that's r-o-b underscore k-a-b-o-b-b awesome so thanks to everyone for sharing some time with us uh you can find us on twitter at the yj files on facebook at crashing the mode on the yj files.tumblr.com on our website crashing the mode.com our email address is whelmed podcast at gmail.com We are also now on YouTube, Stitcher, and iHeartRadio, because apparently we're trying to take over the internet very slowly. Good. Do it so we can have you cover Young Justice season four and five. (laughs) Fingers crossed. Um, I know. Fingers crossed for that. If you enjoy our show, please consider sharing it with a friend. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review on iTunes or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings help others find the show, and if you do leave us a review or rating, please let us know, especially if you're outside the U.S. We have a lot uh, of trouble finding those. We have to look a little bit harder to find them sometimes. 
And even though season three has been officially announced, please continue to spread the word to friends and family about the series by YJ Comics on Comixology and use that hashtag to hopefully maybe get us some more stories even sooner because we'd really love for those tie-in comics to come back if there's a demand and get to get yourself up to speed for the season three premiere whenever that is. I think we've heard 2019 is the new new date. <laughs> we're, we're waiting. We're fingers crossed and patiently waiting for that. And as always, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed. Stay whelmed.